Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm talking today about the evils of socialism. Evil is a strong word. What is evil? You have to define your terms, right? What is evil? What does evil mean? By what standard can we measure some systems as evil and some systems as good? Some things bad, some things good. What is the standard by which we use in order to make such declarations? Well, I'll be curious to find out what standards the socialists use, but I'm gonna tell you what my standard is. My standard is human life, individual human life. That which supports human life, which allows individuals to flourish, to be successful, to be happy. That is the good. Systems that allow individuals to make the most of their lives, to be successful, at living, thou, those are good systems. What is evil? That's the good, and what's evil? Evil is the opposite. Evil is the destruction of life, individual life. Evil is death and destruction. The lack of freedom, the lack of opportunities, the lack of ability to pursue your dreams, to pursue your values, to pursue the rational requirements of human life. The inability, the inability to produce, to create your vision, your life, your happiness, your flourishing as an individual, a system that denies that, that restricts that, is an evil system. So I think I can go home now because it's obvious, right? So why do I say that socialism is evil? Does socialism not promote individual life? Does socialism not encourage individuals to think for themselves and to live for themselves and to make the most of their own life and to be happy? No, it doesn't. It does the opposite. The very nature of socialism is to deny the individual. The very nature of socialism is to reject the idea of an individual, the value of the individual, and to promote, to promote, as it does everywhere where it's practiced. The sacrifice of the individual, the sacrifice of the individual's life to the group, some group, make up your own group, but a group. In Marxism, it's to the proletarian. But all socialists require the subjugation of the individual for the sake of the collective. The denial of the rights of the individual to live as he see fit for the sake of what somebody decides Always a question asked who gets to decide. Somebody is good for the collective. That is the essence of what socialism is. This is why you need central planning. You need central planning because only the central planner, in his wisdom, can know what's good for the collective. Because if we don't have central planners and we allow each one of you to do what's good for you, then what's going to happen to the group, to the collective, to everybody else? You don't know. All you know is what's good for you. So central planning is not a starting point for socialism. It is a requirement of socialism because what the starting point is, the group. The collective, the rejection of you as an individual. And we need authoritarians to channel what's good. Because how do we know what's good for a group? 
How do we know what's good for a group? I don't know. I have no idea how you know what's good for a group. Because groups don't have a consciousness. Groups can't think. Groups don't eat. We don't have a collective stomach. We don't have a collective brain. We don't have a collective anything. So you usually need, need some kind of mystic. This is why I always think communism and socialism are fundamentally mystical beliefs. Because they need an individual who can somehow commune, right? Through some kind of mystical revelation with the proletarian to let us know what's good for the proletarian. And that's why you need a dictator, a leader, somebody in control. So, the group is priming, not the individual. To me, that is enough to prove that socialism is evil. Because it demands morally and politically the sacrifice of the individual to the group. But what about in practice? What actually happens in practice under socialism? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe human beings flourish and are incredibly successful and happy and, f and, and prosperous under socialism. What actually is the history and the evidence? It's hard to look up there. I'm going to focus here, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm ignoring you guys. What's well, actually history about socialism? What do we know actually happens when people adopt this system? Am I right? Is, is, is socialism so horrific to the individual? Well, luckily for us, or actually very, very, very unluckily for most people, certainly the people who have to live under socialism, we have lots of examples. We don't have to speculate about socialism. We don't have to just make it a theoretical idea. We can actually look at history or look at countries that are practicing it right now. And I think my right now favorite example is a country called, it's in South America. What, what, what country right now is practicing socialism in South America. Venezuela. Venezuela. Venezuela has been socialist for 20 years. And socialism has managed to take a country in which, on average, the individuals were the richest, most prosperous, most successful individuals in all of Latin America, in all of South America, and make those people now the poorest people in South America. In 20 years, it's taken a country from relative wealth to absolute poverty. And this is a country, this is hard to do in Venezuela. Why is it hard to do in Venezuela? Because Venezuela has more oil than Saudi Arabia. Venezuela has more oil reserves, more oil in the ground or under the sea than Saudi Arabia. You the wealth. But no, the socialists are so good at this that they have even managed to destroy the country of Venezuela. And this is not a theoretical destruction. This is not just about people who are relatively rich now being relatively poor. This is about people dying in the streets in Venezuela. This is about child mortality rates. The rate at which little babies are dying has gone through the roof because there's no food to feed them. They're not getting enough nutrition to be able to grow up. This is a country where they can't feed their babies. The bodies are starting to pile up in Venezuela. It's not just the issue of inconvenience. There's no toilet paper in Venezuela. There's no soap in Venezuela. They have to go into Colombia to get these luxuries. But this is what socialism does. This is what it does everywhere, wherever it's tried, and to the extent that it is tried. And Venezuela, of course, is a relatively mild case. Where socialism is practiced more consistently, it's much, much worse. You lived under it for decades. Communism is just a logical extension of socialism. 
North Korea, millions of people are starving. Not a few hundred, not a few thousand, but millions. The number of bodies, the number of deaths caused by communism, I don't know if you study this in Poland, is in the tens of millions of people. It makes the Nazis look like amateurs. And yet, when we see a Nazi, when somebody waves a Nazi flag, we run. Or we condemn them. But when we meet a communist, everybody's very nice. Communism's great. It only killed 10 to 20 times more people than the Nazis did. The Soviet Union, they killed about 60 million, and that doesn't even count the people they starved. Mao Zedong killed about 40 million. That doesn't include about 40 million who starved. We're talking about over 100 million bodies of dead people because of socialism. Not because of the particular individuals, because the fact is they adopted these set of ideas has done exactly the same thing. It wasn't that Stalin was an aberration. If Stalin was an aberration, what is Pol Pot? What is the rule of North Korea? Are they also aberrations? And if they're aberrations, why is it that communism attracts all the freaks in the world? Now, this is not, you know, this is not theory. Socialism and communism have destroyed tens, hundreds of millions of lives, killed them. The rest of the people who stayed alive were just poor. They couldn't think what they wanted to think. They couldn't act in the pursuit of their own values. They couldn't do all the things that I would do to survive. Well, they barely survived. Life sucked, to use a technical term. It sucked under communism. It was awful. It was drudgery. It was gray. It was miserable. And that's taking the system of socialism seriously. That's not some perversion of socialism. That's what socialism is. It's the group first. And central planners planning. And if central planners are good at planning one part of the economy, why not have them plan every part of the economy? And when they plan every part of the economy, we call that communism. But that's just an extension of, if they're planning one, we extend it to all of them. Socialism has to evolve into communism, otherwise it's being completely inconsistent. I think there was a bet on that I would use my iPhone and the lecture now. So luckily for us that we don't have a central planner who tries to decide these, right? This insignificant part of our life, this, <clears throat> this that makes our lives better, but at the end of the day, an insignificant part, this we leave to the private sector, this we leave to the markets, because we know, all of us know, even those who think they are pro-socialism know that if a government committee made this, it would be ugly and stupid and I'm being nice. And yet, really important stuff, like our health, like our education, oh, those we have to have central planners for, because God forbid, imagine, imagine, if the same minds who made this, made our health care, and invest in our education, maybe they'd be as pretty and as efficient as this is, I mean, as powerful as this is. So socialism is evil, because everywhere it's practiced, it rejects the individual, it suppresses individual thought, it suppresses individual action, it leads to death, destruction, and poverty. Everywhere where it's practiced. And it has to lead to those things. It has to lead to those things. Because the fact is that the collective, the group, as an end, doesn't exist. As I said, there's no collective stomach, there's no collective brain. We don't collectively reason. The individual is 
what is important. The individual is what exists. So when you build a moral system, an economic system about around a thing that doesn't even exist, the collective, guess what happens? It fails. And it does a really, really bad thing to that that does exist. Now, there are lots of people who can talk about why socialism has to fail economically. And I refer you to the writings of von Mises and Hayek and Milton Friedman and many, many other economists to explain how the market system works, how prices are necessary for the allocation, efficient allocation of goods. Socialism economically just, is just inefficient, it's just silly. And it doesn't work. It does not work. Now, some people are going to say, and I'm sure some people will say, well, but wait a minute, Denmark is socialist. Really? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty funny. There's, no cent There's very little central planning in Denmark. There's no more central planning in Denmark than there is in the United States of America. The Danish government does not own the means of production. The Danish government does not central plan it regulates its banks less than America regulates its banks. It regulates industry less than so-called capitalist America does. What it does is it redistributes wealth. It takes, it allows you the freedom to produce and then it steals your money and gives it to other people. That it does, and it does it pretty well. But it's a mixed economy, it makes us some freedom and some oppression. It happens to have a different combination of elements than the United States system, but it's still the same mixture. The United States, we regulate a lot and we redistribute a little. In Denmark, they regulate a little and they redistribute a lot. And, on top of that, of course, Denmark is a lot poorer than Americans are. <laughs> you can make comments while I speak, all of you. I mean, of course they are on a per capita basis, and in terms of the size of houses, in terms of any economic measure, Danes are a lot, not a little bit, poorer. So if Denmark was a state in the United States, a state, right, like Massachusetts and California, how, where do you think it would rank? If Denmark was a state in California, where do you think it would rank? Rich like, like New York and California, or poor like Mississippi? It would rank number 49. It would be the 49th poorest state in the United States. Look it up. These are numbers. These are facts. You can pretend. People are good at pretending. And if you're a socialist, you have to be good at pretending. Because all of history, all of the facts of history suggest that you're advocating for a system that is an utter and complete failure. And is responsible, as I said earlier, for the worst, most horrific murders in human history. You know, I, I, I still don't quite understand how we tolerate socialists when we don't tolerate Nazis. And that's the economics. So as I said, I encourage you to read Hayek about the, why central planning never works. It's essential. What's essential? Uh, reason why central planning cannot work. Because each one of us has our own values. We have our own life. Some of us like Apple, some of us like Samsung. We like different things. We want different things. We have different aspirations. No central planner knows that. They can't get inside your head. They can't figure out what's good for you and what's bad for you. Not that they care. Right. But even if they care, they can't. They can't tell what you actually desire, what your life is really about. They can average. What they can do is sacrifice your life to other people, which is what they're really good at. They're really good at sacrificing some people for the sake of other people. But nobody in that transaction actually benefits. Everybody loses. They cannot decide what your Values are values are individual. Values are of the individual. You cannot aggregate them. You cannot plan for them. 
This is why markets work, because we each go in as an individual and make decisions based on our priorities, not on somebody else's priorities. When I pay, here it goes again, when I pay $300 for this, it's because this is worth more than $300 to me. But to you it might not be, so you won't buy it. That's the beauty of markets. We get to make voluntary decisions about the values and the products and the services we as individuals want to consume. It's not somebody else making the decision for us. Central planning cannot work because we're different. But that's what they hate. They want us all to be the same. And the whole point of socialism is to try to knock us down and make us the same. And that means not just in material products, but that means in what we think as well. And this is why socialism always leads to oppression of thought. But there's a, there's a greater condemnation of socialism in my view, and that is the moral condemnation. Socialism is morally evil because it places the group and the collective above the individual. The standard of morality is not what's good for society. The standard of morality is not what's good for the proletarian or good for the workers or good for any group. The standard of morality is what is good for you. And you. And you. Not as a collective, not as a group, but as individuals. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. The standard of morality is what's good for each one of us. And what is good for each one of us? What's good for each, other, one, each one of us is to be free to pursue our own individual values. To make our individual lives the best lives that we can make for ourselves. Not for them, not for them, not for the group, not for the state, but for you. Make your life the best life that it can be. That's the purpose of morality, and that is what socialism ultimately condemns. And that's why most people can't condemn socialism. The reason socialism lives on is not because of its economics. There is no, no capital and defense, economic defense of socialism. None, never has been. It is bogus economics from beginning to end. But what they have is they have conventional morality on their side. Because since Christianity, every moral code, whether secular or religious, has advocated for the sacrifice of the individual to the group. Every moral code says your life doesn't matter. What matters is their happiness. You're supposed to sacrifice. You're supposed to be selfless. That's what religion teaches us. That's what most secular philosophers teach us. And that's where the socialists get their power. We all accept it because morally, what's, how can it be bad to sacrifice some people for others? Isn't that what every moral teacher has always taught us? Yeah, and we're screwed because of it. Ultimately, socialism is just secularized Christianity. It's a secularized form of the idea that the purpose of life is to live for others, that the purpose of life is to sacrifice for others. It's time to reject that morality. It's time to come up with an alternative. We can do so much better. And there is an alternative. The alternative that actually leads to human flourishing, that actually creates real values, that actually allows individuals to pursue their life and their own happiness. And that alternative is freedom. That alternative is capitalism. That alternative is free markets where free individuals voluntarily trade, trade. What a concept. It doesn't exist in the social. For value, for value. Win, win. When I buy my iPhone for $300, it's because it's worth more to me than $300. I win, and Apple wins. Nobody loses. We reject a system of liberal capitalism, of individualistic capitalism, the system that has created every ounce of wealth 
that we have on the planet today. Until capitalism, wealth and income were flat for 10,000 years. There was no wealth creation, there was redistribution. There were some people better at stealing than others, but nobody created wealth until we freed up those energies during the late 18th century, early 19th century. Until capitalism, there were no, there were very few grand universities and very, very few people went to them. There were very, very few schools because most kids worked constantly, all the time, on the farm. 50% of them didn't even make the age of 10. Capitalism has led to a longer life, a more prosperous life. It's led to freedom for individuals like never in human history have we seen. It is under the system of capitalism that slavery was ended, that women were emancipated, that we have a sexual revolution where your sexual orientation doesn't matter anymore. That's under freedom, not under socialism. That's where we respect individuals for the sake of the individual. His and her life for the sake of their life. Not as a sacrificial animal to be served up to some collective. So we have an alternative. An alternative is free market capitalism. A system that respects and is built on the idea of individual rights. And what are individual rights? Not what your modern intellectuals will teach you, but what are individual rights at the core? The freedoms. The, the idea that every individual has the freedom to act on behalf of his own life. Every individual has the freedom to do whatever he deems necessary in pursuit of the values necessary for his own life. Individual rights are essentially individualistic. They have to be individualistic. They're individual rights, not group rights, not collective rights. The system of capitalism is built on the principle that each individual is free. That each individual is free to live his life, to think whatever thoughts he wants, to say whatever he wants, even if it is offensive, even if it triggers, even if it's a so-called today microaggression. It's built in the idea that each individual's purpose in life is to pursue his own happiness. Now that's a beautiful vision. That's a beautiful idea. That we give up. We give up. When we put the group ahead of the individual. So socialism is immoral because we reject individualism. It is a failure everywhere it is tried. It is not an example in history, and you'll have a QA and a in a minute. You'll be able to challenge me on that. An example of history of socialism creating any wealth. And socialism is deadly. It has destroyed the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It's literally murdered tens of millions of people. All in the name of some grand experiment in human betterment. Just study Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Just go study what the Soviets actually did and what they tried to do. Or go study Mao's great revolutions. More evil of a set of ideas and a set of practices has never existed on the face of the earth. So I encourage you today to reject these ideas reject them for what they are. Look around the world. In South America, there's another country. It used to be the poorest country in Latin America. And today is the richest. And indeed the freest, socially the freest. What's that? And that's Chile, which adopted the exact opposite of socialism. It adopted capitalist ideas, not fully, not perfectly, but adopted some of them, and not under the right circumstances. But it adopted them. It led to political freedom, it led to economic freedom, and it led to incredible prosperity, incredible wealth. That's in Latin America. But just look around Europe. To the extent that a country respects the individual, 
to the extent that it doesn't demand your sacrifice to the group, to the extent that it practices economic policies that encourage trade, that encourage wars, that encourage wealth creation, to that extent those countries get rich, the individuals in those countries prosper, to the extent that they redistribute, to the extent that they control, to the extent that they regulate, to that extent those countries are failures. So it's time to reject socialism, but not to a vacuum, to an ideal. An ideal that's much more powerful than anything socialism ever offered. It's an ideal of real capitalism, of what the West could be, of what the whole world could be, every country in the world could be. The ideal that even practiced a little bit, just a little bit, like in China and in India and in Taiwan and South Korea, has, create, has brought two billion people over the last 30 years out of poverty. Two billion people. What's it socialism brought them out of poverty? It was just a little bit, not even a lot of capitalism, just a little bit of capitalism brought two billion people out of, out of poverty. Imagine what would happen if we had a lot of capitalism. If we actually took it seriously. If we actually practiced it consistently. We would be richer beyond our, our imagination. We'd be more prosperous beyond our imagination. And you would have more opportunities than you could imagine you have. So reject socialism, adopt capitalism, and to do that, you have to reject the morality of sacrifice, the morality of selflessness, the morality that your life doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the group. And it's time to adopt a morality a moral code of individualism, a morality that places your life as the purpose, your happiness as the goal. Thank you all. More time than for a lecture. We have time for questions, so please line up to this mic and uh, you can ask anything to Yaron. This microphone is waiting for you. Who wants to ask a question? Don't be shy. Ayn Rand was an Eastern European girl. I just actually counted and 90% of the people in the room are dudes. Dudes, guys. So, uh, girls can vote. What shall we do about them? I didn't get the question. I didn't get the question. What should we do about who? Well, the fact that 90% of the people who listen to your lecture are dudes. Yeah. So, that means that, like, most of the people who will vote didn't listen to your lecture. Didn't listen to my lecture. As, as they are girls. Yeah. Right? yeah. Since like, like Ayn Rand. Yes. So, the question is, what do we do about the fact that not enough women show up to my lectures? I don't know. We need a lecturer who's more good looking. That would be that superficial. That, that is disrespectful to women, I apologize. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Why don't women get more involved in, uh, in these activities. I wish they did. Um, but look, I'm very realistic about voting. I know when it comes to the ballot box, I lose, right? So my goal here is not to uh, change politics in Poland because that would be futile. I'm way too radical uh, to change the political <coughs> landscape of Poland. But uh, if you guys have ideas on how to get more women here, I guess one way to do it is for you guys to get a date. <laughs> but then you would have to be stupid enough to take it to a lecture by me, so I don't know. Because when I, when I met my wife, so the first date I took my wife to was a lecture about these kind of ideas. Now it might have been okay, because I've been married 33 years happily, so maybe that's the secret. 
Hi, thanks for your speech, and I would thanks for your speech, and I would like to say that I'm a classical liberal too, like libertarian, whatever you yep. want to call it. Yep. But still, in our in our ideology, there are some hard questions, and I would like to ask you, for example, about tragedy of commons. So yep. let's, say, let's say the EU set quotas for fishing, yep. and we, if we don't set them, they're going to die out in, let's say, five years in a yep. certain area. Yep. So without use of government, it cannot be done, right? So what is, is there a, a so, so the question is, what do we do about the tragedy of the commons? Yeah. Right? So let's, so let's, let's first make clear that if you care about the commons, that is, I guess, nature and the water and the air and the quality of them, then you certainly don't want to live under socialism. No, I'm saying no I'll get to it. I promise I'll answer your question, but I have to make a case, uh, I have to make a case that socialism is evil, right? Socialism was the filthiest political system ever. East Germany, Poland, Russia were filthy 30, 40 years ago. They're much cleaner today. When everything is in the commons, when everything is a public good, who takes care of it? Nobody. I take care of my house. I clean my backyard. This is the, I'm getting to the answer. I clean my backyard. But when we have a common, when we have public space, nobody takes care of it. So it's filthy. Private property is the way in which we solve the problem of the commons. So how do we do it? We sell everything. We make everything private property to the extent that we can. You can certainly sell rivers, for example. If the river was privately owned, then you wouldn't be able to pollute it because that would be a violation of private. I'll get to all your, I'll get to the fish, I promise. And there's legal precedent for this. Rivers used to be privately owned. There used to be water rights. And if, you, if your cows pooped at the top of the river and I was drinking at the bottom of the river, that wasn't good. So there were legal ways in which we resolved our disputes. But when the government owns the river, how do we resolve the disputes? Whoever pounds the table harder, whoever yells the most, whoever threatens to go on strike the most, is going to win out. Not individual interests but political interests, political pressure groups. That's what happens when you leave it in the commons. You need to privatize as much as you can, and even fit ways to privatize. There are ways to corner off areas and give individual people or individual companies restricted fishing rights over those areas. You know, countries like Iceland have attempted strategies like this. And a, a variety of different options being proposed on how you turn things that we think of as the commons into private property. The more you can turn it into private property, the less problem there is. And I think you can turn almost everything into private property. Yeah, I just want to say that in the sea, you can, you can privatize several areas, but still fish swim, right? Yes, so there are a variety of mechanisms you can actually give certain fisheries property rights over certain schools of fish, particularly today with satellites where you can track this stuff. But I'm not a technical, the point is this, I'm not a technical person about fish. I have no idea, right? But the principle is the question. And I'm not an anarchist. I know there's some probably anarchic capitalists here. I'm not an anarchist. I'm an anarchist? Okay. Minarchist. I'm not a minarchist. I don't, I, I don't like that term. It's a stupid term. I believe in limited government. I believe that government has a role in defining property rights. Somebody has to define those property rights and protect them. So I believe in government that protects, defines and protects property rights with a military, a judiciary, and a, mili and, a, and a police force, and that's it. So there is a role in defining these kind of property rights over fish, seas, things like that. But 99% is just, it just sell you know, sell the, 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 the property and, and it's sold. A question from live chat. I tried to convince you that abortion is in fact a violation of individual rights. Have you voted about this issue more? Uh, okay, not related to socialism, but okay. Uh, 
Yes, I mean, I think about it all the time because I always have some Polish students uh, challenging me on abortion. Not always Polish, but often Catholic. Um, yes, absolutely I've thought about it. And yes, absolutely, I hold by my previous position. Abortion. The camera, I'm supposed to look at the camera. <laughs> you over there. Um, abortion should be legal. As a political question, I know you don't think so. Abortion as a political question is a question that deals with individuals that exist right now, right here in reality. The woman exists. The fetus does not as a separate human being. It is a part of the woman. Therefore, it is the woman who has the decision. Now, you can argue morality, but the law only deals with individuals, not with potential human beings, not with individuals inside somebody else's womb, it's not an individual, it's a part of the mother. And as long as it's inside the womb, it is the mother's decision about whether to abort or not. Again, you can argue the morality of it, but legally the state has no business, has no business telling a mother, a woman, that she has to give birth if she doesn't want to give birth to a child. Second question from Kaltuzar. How can you do <laughs> Yes, indeed. Somebody, somebody has to explain the joke to me. How can we defeat a social justice warriors once and for all? How can we beat the social, okay. So how do we beat the social justice warriors once and for all? Once and for all, by rejecting their moral code. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be repetitive all night, but this is about morality. If you accept the morality of the social justice warriors, if you accept their collectivism, or you accept the idea that the individual should be sacrificed to, Fill in the blank, God, the, the, the Pope, the King, the nobleman, the proletarian, the tribe, the group, anything you want, then they win. Your life is yours, not to be sacrificed to anybody. You have a right to live your life as you see fit. As long as you're not violating other people's rights, in other words, as long as you're not using coercion on your neighbor, you must be left free, left alone, and the social justice warriors can go to hell, where they're ultimately gonna go, although I don't believe in hell. Um, th th there's nothing there, there. The social justice warriors don't have a leg to stand on, but we have to battle them on principle, not just on the particular issues that they try to bring up. They, you know, because they're smart, they're clever in terms of how they present the issues. We need to chop their legs off of them intellectually, which means take away the moral code that they rely on. Hello, Mr. Brook. Uh, what do you think the libertarian movement as a whole, you, as you know, it's heavily divided between, uh, because of these arguments like... Uh, so it's heavily divided between what? Between abortion, for example, there's this anarchists who think the other, the rest of the libertarians uh, are, are stupid or something. Uh, and uh, what do you think the libertarian movement as a whole needs to uh, become united? Like in the 2008, we, uh, America had yeah, America had Ron Paul. He uh, pretty much uh, united the the largest uh, population of libertarians in America. But he, but uh, I, uh, the the primaries Republican, they were rigged, right? He, he ran in the Republican primaries. Look, Ron Paul, you know, I'll, I'll say something about it. Ron Paul, all Ron Paul got in the Republican primaries was 10% of the Republican vote. That's not a lot, right? In a few states, he did very well, but in most, on average, he got about 10% of the Republican vote. So Ron Paul was very popular among young people, and very popular among libertarians, but most Americans are not libertarians. So you want me to comment on the libertarian movement, which is a tricky subject for me to comment on, but I'm going to do it, right? And piss off a lot of people here and in America. I think the libertarian, I don't think there is such a thing as a libertarian movement, because for the reasons you mentioned. It's fractured, and it doesn't have a common core. I think anarcho-capitalism, for example, or the general anarchism, particularly the Maui Rothbard school of anarcho-capitalism, is substantially, significantly, philosophically flawed and a liability to those of us who believe in freedom. The ideas are a liability to those of us who believe in freedom. 
So I think the libertarian movement needs to coalesce, but it needs to coalesce around a philosophy that can be defended, not a set of ideas that undercut freedom and undercut liberty, which I think, I think many who follow Murray Rothbard do. So it's going to stay fragmented for a long time. Yes, it's going to be fragmented, but uh, what do you think? <laughs> right. Uh, what do you think? Is there a chance in the near future for libertarian to flourish, to, uh, to go no. into the minds of the mainstream? <laughs> in the near future, if you mean by the near future, 10 years. In the next 20, 10 years, 20. we're not going to win. Free markets are not going to win. Not in the sense that we mean free markets, where, where the rivers are privatized. Rivers are not going to be privatized in the next 10 years. They're not going to be privatized in the next 20 years. Maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 is starting to talk about a time frame that I believe. Look, this is, I, I'm going back to the same point I've already made, so I apologize if this bores you. This is not a question of economics. If the question was, what better economic, what system of economics works best? Free market would have won a long, long time ago. We have no competition. There's nobody in the world who comes close to the ability of the free market to produce wealth, to produce everything that we need in order to survive and to live and to thrive and to flourish. It's by far not even close the best system. That's not the debate. The debate is a moral debate, and that's going to take a long time to change people's way of thinking from the collectivism that's been entrenched in us for millennia to an individualism that we saw a brief period in European history during the Enlightenment that we embraced and then rejected very quickly. So what we need is to return to that spirit of enlightenment, that spirit of individualism, and that's going to be hard, very hard. Thank you. So, I, but let me also say this. There's more energy among free marketers in Eastern Europe and of all places in Brazil than there is in the West. The West, in Western Europe, in America, you know, we're too rich and lazy. Life's too good. Why have radical ideas when you can get the iPhone 7 tomorrow, right? Why worry about free markets when life, you know, you're still making a good living, you're driving a nice car, life is good. <clears throat> you guys in Poland, but even more so in some of the other Eastern European, you're still hungry. You still want more. You still know you could be freer, you could be richer, you could pursue your dreams even more than is being allowed today. So if there's hope for the libertarian movement, to the extent there is one, I think it's in Eastern Europe, I think it's in, I think it's in South America, uh, it's in places that have lived, lived socialism, lived fascism, that know what collectivism does to the soul, not just to, the, to, the, to money, but to the soul of human beings, how destructive it is, and want something different and want something new. So all the power to you guys, because it's going to come from here. Not, I, I'm, I'm starting to believe that we should not look to America for, for hope, but we should look elsewhere. Doctor, I have a question about morality, because uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Do you believe that uh, morality should be, uh, should be taken an interest in uh, economy or not? That's the first question. Yes, I do. So, so you think that morality should be uh, should should be a component of the good economy? No, economics is a science, but you have to have a moral foundation to be able to justify. For example, uh, we posit in economics that it's good to maximize wealth, but wealth maximization is not an economic question. It's a it's a moral question. So is it good to maximize wealth is a moral question, not an economic question. And one of the reasons as economists we fail to convince is because we make assumptions that we think are self-evident. Well, everybody's a utility maximizer. No, they are not. People are not utility as in is it financial utility, wealth maximization. People are not. 
So you are saying that to be in an eco homo economicus, that's the term which is uh, which has been used by a lot of uh, yeah. co uh, yes. a lot of uh, economists. I'm saying there's no such thing as homo economicus. That's what I'm saying. Really, because most of people who, who are seeing here from their book, they are reading economy. Uh, economy is not about the morality. It's about this economy. Yeah. And I'm just so I think this is why we're losing because economists don't see the value and importance of philosophy. Philosophy is primary to economics. Philosophy is foundational. Philosophy sets both the methodology and the morality of the assumptions you make in economics. If, my, if I believe that the purpose of society is to achieve equality, then you will generate a different economic economicus, in a sense, will be a different creature if the purpose is equality, if it's driven by equality. Because what I'm hearing, that the answer on the socialism for you is the liberalism, yeah? But for me, it's not such easy, because for the answer on the so socialism is Christian for me. Yes. That's yeah, the no. first fact. Yeah, so let me say. What you said about, for example, uh, more political, political words like, for example, abortion, yeah. that is the women's choice. Yes. For me, it's not so easy uh, to uh, be such a liberal because we are living, for example, in some uh, national, uh, yeah. nation, uh, some nations, yeah? We are, for example, we are all... I know We that, have yeah. our interests, yeah? And you don't have an interest. There's no such thing as a Polish interest. You are individuals with interest. There's no such thing as a Polish interest. And there's no so, so but let me, let, me, let me deal with a more important question, which you said. You said your solution to socialism is Christianity. And, and you, it is for you. I think you're wrong. I think as long as you hold on to that, and I'm going to offend everybody here, but that's okay. Uh, I think as long as you hold to your Christianity, socialism will not disappear from the world because I think socialism is secularized Christianity. My solution to socialism is not liberalism. You should read Marx. It's not liberalism. Maybe you do. It's not Maybe. liberalism. It's the morality of individualism, which is a morality that rejects Christian morality. I reject Christian morality. I think Christian morality is wrong. I think it's not good for you. But Sorry, all Tom. wealth is built, uh, was built on the Christian morality. The wealth of the European was no, not built in no. 19th the century. The wealth of Europe was, was built, built in the 14th century during the uh, No, that's just not true. The wealth of Europe was built on a rejection of Christianity. The wealth of Europe was, was built in the 18th and 19th centuries. In the 18th and 19th centuries. The 18th century was called the age of reason, not the age of Christianity. And the age of reason was an age of rejection of religion, of marginalization of religion, where religion became a private activity and was, was, was secularized. The era of the, seventh, the 18th and 19th century are secular eras, where Christianity is marginalized, and that's why the individual suddenly flourishes, human reason suddenly is elevated, human reason is suddenly elevated, and the West creates enormous amounts of wealth. The 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries are centuries of bloodshed, of, of war, of combat, of wealth destruction, not wealth creation. Wealth creation only comes from the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is much more pagan than it is Christian. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, I have a question. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that, uh, that you don't, do not believe in anarcho-capitalism, you believe in limited government. Yes. Uh, so how would you combine uh, individualism, individuality, uh, economic agenda with a uh, kind of a national uh, community uh, need, uh, in the way, especially in the wake of uh, Brexit and Mr. Trump uh, successful <laughs> campaign, which clearly uh, refers feeling and also um, signalize uh, this atta disattachment between signals what uh, signals uh, disattachment between a uh, group of people and uh, their government and their their kind of all uh, institution of the of the government so i'm not sure i understand your question but let me try right um, 
And that's how it's connected to anarcho-capitalism. So I believe, in, I believe in government. I believe in limited government. Um, and I believe that the job of government is the protection of individual rights. I do not believe in nationalism. Nationalism is a form of collectivism. It says that the nation is above the individual. And the purpose of the individual, moral purpose of the individual, is the sacrifice to the nation. I think that is an evil ideology. I use evil, you know, together with socialism. And I think those who support Trump for nationalistic reasons, that is bad, very bad. I think those who voted for Brexit for nationalistic reasons, it's bad. Now, I supported Brexit for capitalist reasons. Because once Britain left the European Union, it was now possible for them to liberalize their economy in ways they could not do as part of the European Union. So it was a way to, to bring individualism to UK, to Britain, in a, well, to the UK, in a way that they couldn't as part of the e European Union. So that's why I support it. But a lot of people who voted for, for Brexit support it for other reasons. Xenophobia, hatred of immigrants, uh, anti-liberal values. So, so I, I, I guess, again, my view is nationalism qua nationalism. The state, as more important than the individual, is bad. And what we are individuals, the state is our servant. The state works for us to protect our rights. And that's the only job of the state. The state has no other responsibilities, no other job, no other work other than protect our individual rights. And to do that, all the state needs to do is police, military, and the justice system. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I will try to play uh, devil advocates. And uh, you mentioned that, or you defined uh, a good as a, a good system as the system which allows individuals to pursue their own happiness. Yes. Uh, and you mentioned, for instance, Denmark, which is relatively poorer than most of the states in the United States. Yeah. But actually, if you ask an uh, average Denmark uh, guy if he feels happy with his life, uh, he, says he will yes. feel much uh, more happy than the guy from the New York. So, all right, I, I get this question every time. So, <laughs> here's my thick standard answer to the happiness in Denmark question. One, I mean, it's more, it, there are a few steps to this. One, if you're Scandinavian, you're expected to be happy. It's part of the culture. You ask a Scandinavian if you're happy, they generally say yes. I'm Jewish. You ask a Jew if they're happy, we always say no. Because if we said yes, everybody would be happy. How could you be happy? Nobody's happy. Happiness. So it's a cultural thing. A lot of this is cultural. Two, if you actually take Danes, Danish people, in America, and ask them if they're happy, in America, they're at least as happy as Danes in Denmark, if not happier. So if you can control for all the cultural issues, Danes love their lives in America as much, if not more, than Danes in, 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 in Denmark. And there's a reason for that. If you just isolate Danes, Danes in America are richer than Danes in Denmark. Danes in America live as long, if not longer, than Danes in Denmark. There are fewer Danes that are poor in America than there are poor Danes in Denmark. Now part of that selection bias, people who left Denmark, you know, maybe are more motivated, more entrepreneurial, maybe this is something. But the fact is that America doesn't prohibit Danes from being happy. So there's something else probably going on here when we do happiness studies, which I'm suspicious of. How many people know what happiness is? Can we define happiness? It's very hard. What's that? Yeah, it's different for different people. Aristotle said, I mean, I think there is a definition of happiness, but it's very hard to define and to know even if you're happy. Well, um, definition of happiness is individual. It's it is for individual. every single person. It's individual, but it's also based. You see, we are a certain biological animal. We have certain characteristics. Certain things make human beings, qua human beings, happy. Certain things make us unhappy. People are not happy in authoritarian regimes. Again, the difference between Denmark and the United States from the perspective of economic freedom is very small. 
The United States spends about 36% of GDP by the government. Denmark spends maybe 42% of GDP. It's not, we're not talking about socialism and capitalism. We're talking about a mixed economy of America and a mixed economy of Denmark. And I'm not saying one is better than the other because it's hard to tell, they're both mixed. I would like them both to be capitalist and I think people would be a lot happier by any measure if they were truly capitalist. Considering uh, that, obje that an objective state could not coerce its citizens into paying taxes, how long do you think it would last in a world full, full of powerful states and other terrorist groups that want to violently impose their <coughs> ideologies upon us? I think it would last forever. Uh, because in an so the question is, in an objective state, uh, you know, where you don't coerce taxes, how is it going to last when these other countries can use coercion, steal all their citizens' money, and launch massive armies against you? Do you know how rich we're going to be in an objective state? Well, I mean, me just giving a small contribution, a fraction of my wealth would be far more... Look at Putin, right, your pal, over there in the east. His economy is crumbling. Wealth creation is plummeting. He has no money. So yes, he can for a while pour whatever money he has into new missiles and new tanks and new... But he's going to go bankrupt very quickly. If I had a rich country next to him, I could, I could destroy him easily. And you know, and you see this, you see this exactly. So, you know, I don't know if you're asking where would, they, where would a free country get its funding from, or you're asking how big the funding would be. But I think if there was a real threat, I would be willing to give a lot of money to the government to protect me. If there was a real threat, I wouldn't give them a dime to send my son to Vietnam or to Iraq, but I would give them real money to, to, to do away with somebody who was trying to kill me and my family. And that's what a voluntary society does. In a voluntary society, you pay for the things you believe in. And if it's a war you believe in, you pay a lot of money. Because it's a war you believe in. Because the war is a self-defense war, and they're gonna kill you if you don't win the war. So, I, I'll give you an, you know, I come from Israel, right? Israel has a conscription army, it's a draft, you have to go. Men go three years, women go two years. I think that's wrong, even for Israel, which has an existential threat. Israel should have a volunteer army. And if your argument would be, well, not enough people will volunteer, then my argument would be that Israel doesn't deserve to exist. It doesn't. If you're not willing to fight for your country, then the country shouldn't exist. Right? If you love your country, then volunteer to fight for it. Okay? So you've got a mechanism here by which if you value the things that you live in, if you value your family, if you value your life, if you value your possessions, then fight for them. And you'd have a much better army. Israel would be so much better if it had a volunteer army than it is under conscription. I have no doubt about it. That's a rather optimistic vision of people. In I have a very optimistic vision of people, and, and I know sometimes it's hard uh, in certain countries to have that. And I don't know about Poland, but in some countries it is. But even though I grew in Israel, which is a very pessimistic view of people, uh, most Israelis have, um, I have an American sense of people, which is a very positive view of, of human, uh, human beings, when they are pursuing their own interests, when they really have the freedom to value themselves and their lives and their families. People are amazingly benevolent, amazingly good, and amazingly rational. Thank you. We call the socialism evil, but uh, isn't it a necessary evil? Uh, because I think that uh, in the opposition between capitalism and communism, uh, the capitalism substantializes itself. Capitalism what? Substantialized. Uh, gives substance to it. The opposition gives substance to the capitalism and uh, thus capitalism is able to justify its own little evils. Yeah, that's, I mean, that sounds like some, prof uh, you know, Marxist professor said this. Uh, I have no <laughs> idea what that meant. Uh, no. Capitalism works. It doesn't work because communism exists. It doesn't work as a counter to communism. It works. It works because it leaves individuals free to pursue their lives. It works because it leaves entrepreneurs free to invent great things, go build them if they can convince people to give them money and come to work for them. 
It works. It creates wealth for everybody. Everybody in society is willing to work. It's better than the capitalist. So why would you ever want anything else? Why would you want a mixture? Why would you want just a little bit of socialism or a little bit of poison? What you need is no, I want no poison. I want no socialism, not a little bit, not a lot. It's evil, evil even in a little bit of doses. If you let the market work, we become much richer and we're freer, we're freer to do the things, not just, um, you know, it's no accident that you suddenly saw flourishing in the arts once capitalism comes into being. Because suddenly the middle class gets rich but not only did they get rich, but now they have time. How many, how many people do you think in the past went on vacations 300, 400 years ago? There was no such thing as a vacation. You work every day of the year from sunrise to sunset. Vacation? There were no restaurants, there were no hotels. You ate what you grew in the land. Suddenly, under capitalism, you had free time. You went to concerts, you went to restaurants. We today, we spend more time doing stuff like that than we do working. That's not the history of the human race. The history of the human race is one of toil, <coughs> constant toil. And suddenly, capitalism liberated us. And socialism wants to return us to that condition of toil. I say, to hell with that. I want, to, I want my restaurants. I want to go see a movie. I want to have my free time, and I love my work. I want to be able to choose my work. I don't want to be a farmer. One of the beauties of capitalism is division of labor, where we each choose what we can do, and not told by the authorities what profession you should have. So by every measure, in my view, of human success, qua human, capitalism's great, socialism's horrible. So why would we have a little bit of this horrible thing? We've heard quite a bit about, about Denmark, right? Um, for me, Denmark is like a lovely village love around the Maersk shipping company, right? So that's easy to be rich. Anyway, my question is this. Um, what would be your top five if, if you were to rank countries by the possibility of them becoming the libertarian oh, paradise? My call is Poland comes first. Your hope is the polling comes first? That's my hope. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough one. I was just, I'll give you an example. I was just in Georgia. Uh, Georgia and Tbilisi. And, and it's pretty amazing in Georgia. They've done things that I don't know any country in the world has done in 100 years. For example, there was a period of 10 years in Georgia where they had no food inspectors. There were no government food inspectors. Guess what happened? What would you think would happen if we did away with food inspectors? Everybody would get sick, right? Because the best way for McDonald's to make money is to make you sick. So the beauty of what happened in, in Georgia is nothing happened. They had no food inspectors, nothing. They have, to this day, there are no work safety inspectors. You know, people who go in the workplace and in uh, factories and in construction sites and check that it's safe. No inspectors. Guess what happened? People didn't start dying and falling off and, and bad stuff didn't happen. Nothing happened. So Georgia's done things in no other country that I know of. So maybe it's Georgia. I think yes. I mean, there seems to be an energy in Poland. There seems to be interest in these ideas in Poland that you don't see in many other countries. Um, you see the same thing in Brazil. There's a lot of excitement, but it's a big country. 200 million people say it's tougher. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just, I, you know, Estonia maybe? Top five. I mean, you know, deep down, really deep down, I still think it's the United States. <laughs> I still think it is. You know why? Because they still, deep down, hidden under the Trump, and under Hillary and under all the garbage is an American sense of life that still believes in individualism. And uh, so I'd say it's the US, it's probably Poland, Georgia, Estonia, Brazil. There's five. And my Colombian friends are just pissed off at me. Right what now. about Somalia? 
Somalia is a disaster. Somalia would never happen. Somalia is not anywhere close to a free market, never has been. All those silly books about Somalia, uh, whatever, libertarianism, are garbage. It's nonsense. You have to have property rights, and there are no property rights in Somalia. You can say that I got triggered by your opinion about Christianity. I'm not surprised. <laughs> but, but you came up here, you didn't run away screaming, going to hug a teddy bear. So you're much better than students at Brown University. Thank you. Uh, so I want to ask you to think about my uh, arguments. Christianity is often misunderstood, like crusades or burning. No, no, this I don't is, think of it in terms of crusades yeah, and burning. But, uh, like, let, me, let me tell you a story, right? Because I don't want to get into a long argument about Christianity. That could go all year, right? So, I, I, personally, I became an atheist at around age six. It's not that I have something against Christianity. I have against every religion almost equally. Some a little bit worse than others, but generally, I object to religion. I object to the idea of faith. I don't have faith. You want, to, you want me to believe something? Show me evidence. There's no evidence to the existence of God. There's no evidence to, to, to the existence of Jesus and miracles and all this stuff. That's mysticism, which I reject all of it. From Deepak Chopra to Christianity, I reject all of it. New age, new, you know, old age doesn't matter to me. But this is what, this is the essence to me of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim morality. And I know you don't like to lump them all together, certainly so don't Islam, but, but this is true. There's one in the Bible, that all religions is a molecule, is a symbol of goodness, of morality, of virtue. And that person is, that all three religions agree. It's, it's very rare that all three religions agree, but anyway, that person is Abraham. Now, why is Abraham considered a moral giant? What did he do? This is what he did. God came to him and told him to kill his oldest son. And he said, Yes, sir. Now, God comes to me and asks me to kill my son. I tell him to go to hell. And I'm not trying to insult your God, but that's what I tell him. I'd rather die, I'd rather be in eternity in hell than kill my own son. And, and in the name of a God that would ask such a thing. What an evil thing to ask. And yet, it is because Abraham says, yes, sir, that he is considered a moral hero in all three religions. Religion, these three religions, are morally authoritarian. And I'm against authoritarianism in everything. I'm against philosophical authoritarianism, epistemological authoritarianism, moral authoritarianism, and political authoritarianism. Thomas who? Aquinas. Yes, Thomas Aquinas. Crazy, trying to combine reason and faith somehow and failed. He's logical. Yes, he is logical. And at the end of the day, he's completely unconvincing. He can't even convince himself, I don't believe. And but but look, Thomas Aquinas is a genius. I I I mean he brought reason back into the West. He 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 caused the Christian church to abandon its Neoplatonism that Augustine established. And he brought reason back into the church and back into Western civilization. And for that, I hope he's in heaven and he should be, he, he's a great hero even to an atheist like me. I love Thomas Aquinas, right, for that fact. But he's wrong when he tries to use reason to justify God. All his arguments have been shown to be illogical and wrong. There is no logical explanation for God. And there certainly isn't a logical explanation for killing your son, no matter who tells you to do it. So, as I said, I don't want to have a long conversation uh, with Christianity. Two arguments. First, you compared Christianity, uh, uh, socialism, yeah. to Christianity. Yeah. But the main uh, difference I can see is that Christianity lets you to decide whether you want to sacrifice yourself and to what degree. But socialism uh, makes that decision for you. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me give you another example. Now, granted, I Granted, I'm Jewish, not Christian, right? So I know my Old Testament better than I know my, my New Testament. So all my examples are from the Old Testament. So you could say, you know, we, we've evolved from that. When Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he's coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, 
and a bunch of Jews are sacrificing a golden calf, he does not go up to those Jews and say, you have a right to worship wherever you want. Just leave us alone. Go out there and go do your thing. He takes a sword and he kills 30,000 people. And God rewards him for that, makes his brother the priest of the Jews. Sorry, I don't like that God. I don't like him. I don't want to follow his teachings. That is not right. That's not political freedom. That's not free speech. That's not freedom of religion. That's not choice. They made a choice to worship a golden calf. It might be a bad choice. It might be an evil choice. They didn't hurt anybody. They don't deserve to die. And we could go on and on all night, as I said. And I'm not going to convince you, and you certainly are not going to convince me. But hopefully I planted seeds of doubt. And also the second thing yeah. is that uh, Christianity is more capital, uh, capitalistic than you might think, because Christians believe in afterlife, yeah? Yeah, but just ask this current pope if he's a capitalist. <laughs> well, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, and the Except thing God, is, if this is presented. Christians should believe that if you sacrifice yourself in this life, you get more in yeah. the Act in this life and sacrifice yourself in this life for the purpose of the reward, that is immoral. You're supposed to act in this life properly not because of the reward. That's Christianity as I understand it. You're not, the reward is there, but that's not the purpose. You can't use that. If you, Immanuel Kant said that if you act to benefit somebody else and in the back of the mind you think it's gonna make me feel good, it's not a moral act anymore. And Christianity holds a very similar view. You have to do it because you're supposed to do it. The commandments don't say do these things and I've got candy at the end. They say, do these things. Period. There's somebody behind me. I'm done. <laughs> My question is about... Not on religion, I hope. No, of Good. course not. <laughs> uh, what's, uh, in, in your opinion, the best way to reject socialism, to advocate for capitalism, to annihilate uh, socialists, uh, should we simply uh, establish, for example, AGOs, foundations, and, and so on? I, or should I think we you start for start for run for uh, parliament, for example, and decentralize the regime, uh, or maybe should we just simply persuade our families and, and our right. relatives? I think you change the world through education, 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 and, and education. I don't just mean formal education. I mean speaking, writing, talking, speaking, writing, all the time, right? Lecturing, uh, you know, teaching, if you're a teacher. Uh, but you've got to use all the tools that you have to educate people about individual liberty. And it has to be individual liberty versus socialism. And what each one means to human life. What they constitute in terms of human life. And that's, that's the thing that we have to keep pushing. And politics will, politics will happen. You, I, I don't view politics as my aim. Politics, somebody who likes politics, God forbid, you know, will, will go into politics. But you got the, the key thing. We get the politicians we deserve. America right now deserves Donald Trump. I didn't think I'd ever say that, but it does. Um, so what we need to focus is on the people, particularly young people who are open to new ideas. So I'd say educate, 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 speak, speak, speak. Tell the history of socialism. Tell them what it's really about and tell them what the you know, what the alternative is like and what the benefits are, the massive benefits are to an individualistic political system. Sure. Are there any socialists here who want to talk to me? Socialists, I can try. Um, you said that, uh, that the capitalism allowed uh, all of us to like, make the number of working hours smaller and yeah. the vacations and so on. But, uh, to be allowed to do that, to like make the working the shorter, yeah. we did a whole lot of blood of workers shed on the streets yeah. in the protests. Yeah. And uh, of course, it speeded up things because yeah. the, the capitalists made the working days, the number of working hours shorter earlier, right? Yeah. So um, 
So the answer is that historically that's just not true. The blood in the street is not what caused our working hours to shorten. What caused working hours to shorten is the rise in the productivity of labor, which was caused by the yes, investment the capitalists made. And as that rise in productivity of labor, as it happened, yeah, course, workers got more negotiating power because they were more productive. They could, and they negotiated with, but, but look, um, people tell me, you know, capitalism, uh, you know, you needed government to get rid of child labor. That's completely false historically. Child labor always disappears, yeah. always disappears before the laws. The laws come into place after the child labor has disappeared for two reasons. One, children are not very productive. They're just not very productive. So very quickly, because of capital investment, machines are replacing children. And secondly, I don't know how many you have, I don't know, a 10-year-old. Imagine having a 10-year-old as an employee. I mean, it would, it's, you can't manage it. It's ridiculous. So capitalism got rid of child labor. Capitalism is the first economic system in human history that abolished child labor. Not socialism, not people in the streets. You look at every country, every single country, passes laws to eliminate child labor exactly when child labor is almost non-existent. Before capitalism, all children worked. All children worked before capitalism. They just worked on the farm. We consider that okay. Factories is not. They died before age 10. Half of them didn't make it to age 10. Capitalism improved the life of children dramatically. Okay, but can you somehow justify that, um, that the, 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 so the progress of the workers in the factories didn't contribute at all to the speed up of the process of making, making uh, life of, of, of making the, 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 their the life workers, easier. the progress of the workers in factories or, or, or on the streets? Yeah, the, the process in general, it speeded up things, right? A little bit because sure, the, because they got more productive. And they got some negotiating power, and they negotiated better terms. Okay, but, but it wasn't in America. There wasn't blood flowing in the streets by workers. There were a few worker riots in the in the United States, but they were marginal as compared to the bigger exactly. questions that were going on in, in under capitalism in the 19th century, and the 20th century. Yeah, but still, if uh, if, if if the capitalists, if the owners of, of the factories didn't limit the number of the working hours, should it, shouldn't uh, would it it be more profitable for them? To Wouldn't it be what? More profitable for them if the workers no. work really from dawn to dusk. And no, 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 no. You've never worked, you've never been a boss. Look. Actually, I will. Well, but, but still. Workers are not more productive if they work longer. They're actually more productive if they work shorter hours and, and they're more intense. Workers are paid well, not because the, 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 the manager is forced to pay them well or because he's a nice guy. They're paid well because that incentivizes them to work more productively, harder, use their minds more, and get engaged. And because it prevents them from leaving to the competitor who would hire them if they were being paid too little. So the market is what drives up wages. It's competition. But what makes the worker more productive is his own skills, his own learning, his own ability, and the capital invested in him, the machinery, the knowledge that is provided to him by the owner. So what drives up wages and shortens time is markets. So I, I am, Henry Ford is, is a great example. So Henry Ford decided he wanted the best workers in his factory in the world. So he doubled the wages. One day, he woke up and doubled wages. They, I think they went from two and a half dollars an hour to five dollars an hour for his work. And what happened? Right? The best workers came to work for Ford, and he fired the people who couldn't produce at five bucks an hour. He kept the good ones, and it drove wages up. And then GM, General Motors over here, was looking, its best workers were going over there for five bucks. So they had raised their wages to five bucks for the best workers. So that process of competition for labor, competition for resources is what drives up wages and shortens the work. Thanks. Uh, you've said today that the West lost its interest, interest uh, in, uh, uh, in keeping, uh, it lost its interest in capitalism. 
And my question is, is there a way to keep cap the interest in capitalism permanent, permanent in the society uh, if the economical prosperity results in the lack of interest in the society? No, I don't think it's economic prosperity results in the lack of interest. I think it's the morality. It's all about morality. So, the re so this is, uh, this is a, the story of Chile. So Chile has become very, very rich, right? It's become very successful. And uh, you've got income inequality, right? And they used to be very poor. And now two elections in a row, they've chosen a socialist who's undoing all the things that made them rich. And the question is why? So I asked, uh, I, I didn't ask, there was a talk by a, a, a famous Chilean by the name of Jose Piñera. Jose Piñera was the one who privatized the pension system in Chile. So he was involved in this market liberalization. So he was asked, why is this happening? And Piñera's answer was, the people who are successful feel guilty. So they vote socialist in order to reduce their guilt. Why do they feel guilty? Because morality, as we understand it, as you guys understand it, as I understand it, teaches that you're supposed to be selfless. Sacrifice is good. Your, your, your moral duty, first and foremost, is to take care of the poor. And you're not doing it because you're too busy running your business and taking care of your family and doing the good things in life, which I believe all good, right? So what do you feel when you're living one life that you should be Mother Teresa? What, what, do, what do you feel? What's the emotion? Guilt. Now, in order to reduce the guilt, the easiest way is to delegate the responsibility to government. Your moral responsibility, you delegate to government. So I vote to raise my taxes. Why? Because that way those people will be taken care of and I can go back to living my life and I feel better about myself because I... I've made a sacrifice. This is how it works. California, we from 10% to 13%, 30% increase. How do you think the rich voted? For it. The rich always vote to raise taxes in America because they feel guilty. Another example. They feel guilty. It's not intellectual. It's here. It's morality. I'll give you another example. I was at a, 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 a luncheon, a, a lunch. There's a, a Lifetime Achievement Award for American businessmen. This is in Charleston, South Carolina. So there were no liberals, liberals in the American side. So there were no leftists there. These were all conservatives. And they read long bios to recognize the achievements of this person, right? And what do they read in the bio? A minute for their business achievement and nine minutes for their community service and their charity. All the things that at the end of the day are insignificant to the lives of anybody. What really matters is what you do with your business life. You're changing the world every day you go to business if you're making money. But they're so ashamed of making money. Conservatives. They're ashamed of making money. And what they love is the charity and the community service. That's what they're proud of. I told them they should be ashamed. Luckily, I was a keynote speaker. I told them they should be ashamed of themselves. Charity and community service are nice. I'm not against them. But they're not what define you as a human being. It's your productive achievement that define you. But morality tells us your productive achievements are selfish. You've got to feel bad about them. You can't feel completely good about them. As you get older, you feel more and more guilty. I want to eliminate that guilt, that's unearned guilt. I say, no, your life is the purpose of your life. Go out there and be self-interested. That is morality. Morality is about self-interest. It's not about sacrifice. It's not about selflessness. It's not about thinking of others. Morality is, by, it should be, as defined by Aristotle. I'm in the Aristotelian tradition. Ayn Rand is in the Aristotelian tradition. It's about your life. It's about your eudaimonia. It's about your flourishing. And we can argue about what gives individuals flourishing. But the focus of the entire science of morality should not be studying some ancient book or revelation of what some being told us, it should be the scientific study of what leads to human flourishing. What activity should you be engaged in so you can live a flourishing, happy, long, successful life? That's what morality should be about. Not commandments, but science. And we know the science. We know what causes human flourishing. We just need to unleash it. That was a long answer. Are we running so, out of time? Tommy, you look nervous. <coughs> okay, so let's say that this question will be a bit about quite a relevant topic today and uh, let's say current politics. 
I mean the refugee crisis. Uh, and I mean that once our lovely European politicians let all those people in, yeah. what we should do with this afterwards? Because well, most of them are actually young males, let's say, from the photographs at least I can see. And they actually do not want to work in Europe, they want just to, let's say, live on the free stuff. Except welfare. Yes. yes. So, you know, you've got a welfare state. You can't just let anybody and everybody in who's going to suck at the tits of the state, right? That's wrong. It doesn't make any sense. Um, in particular, it doesn't make any sense when we've got a war going on. There's a war with radical Islam, which we pretend doesn't exist. So you don't let the enemy just flood in where you can't tell the difference of who's your friend and who's the enemy. Now, I, I believe generally in open immigration when your country's free and when you're not at war, right? So get rid of the welfare state, beat the enemy, crush him, as I would do, and then you can have immigration, open immigration. So from my experience, the disparity between the poorest and the richest is the most frequent justification for intervention in yeah. all those. And how would you comment on that? How would you answer a person who uses such an argument? Yeah, I'm not being rude. I'm just going to pick up my book. It's called Equal is Unfair. Equality sucks. The only equality that means anything is equality before the law, equality of freedom, equality of rights. Other than that, we are unequal. Look around the room, we're all different. And when we're free, they're gonna be different outcomes. That's beautiful, that's amazing, I love inequality. I think inequality is terrific. Inequality is a sign, usually, of freedom. So, I think we have to, you see, a lot of libertarians say, oh look, under capitalism, we'll have less inequality. I don't, that's nonsense. My answer is who cares? The gap is irrelevant. The question is, is wealth being created? Are people getting better off? Are the poor rising up? The poor under capitalism used to be, you know, the poor in the West used to be dirt poor. Today, they're up here. They're still poor relative to the rich. <clears throat> they got cars, they got iPhones, they got air conditioning. It's not the poor of Cambodia. You wanna see poor, go to Cambodia. They're no poor like Cambodia in the West, right? So I don't, you know, I don't worry about inequality. I, you know, uh, I, I give the example of inequality in, um, in uh, you know, in anything. I love the fact that, you know, the guy who made this is like smarter than me. He's more productive than me. He has a, he has a sense of beauty that I don't, right? And he, I could never build this. And he made billions of dollars doing it. I love it. I, I wish he made more, because that would have been a sign that he created even greater products. Unfortunately, he died. Right? But when I see somebody making a lot of money, I go, "Cool, thank you. You must have made my life better in some way." That's the right attitude to inequality. But read my book. It's really good. Okay, I got a pretty short questions for you. The first one is, do you think that consequent objectivism will lead to world government? That's the first What's that? Say that again? Uh, do I think that objectivism will yes, lead to world government? Implemented consequent objectivism yes. will lead in political practice, yeah. long term, that the result will be one world, world government. Yeah. No, I don't. Uh, I, and I think that there's always going to be multiple states, and it's good because they'll compete on different issues, so I don't think objectivism says, here's the list of laws, all governments are gonna have exactly the same laws. There's gonna be deviation. We're gonna define property rights differently, we're gonna punish criminals differently. And it's good to have different countries doing things a little bit differently, and partially to see what works and what doesn't. I do believe the ideal world, all governments will protect individual rights, but there will be some variation. Just like the Founding Fathers created a federal system with states, where each state could experiment within bounds. They could experiment, I believe, in a world where people would still experiment within the bounds of protecting individual rights. Okay, so another question. Is there any candidate in current US elections that you would consider endorsing? 
No. Okay, and the last question? No, I mean, they're all awful, right? Okay. All of them. I mean, Gary Johnson is not a bad guy, but he's just milk toast. I mean, he's just not that interesting. I mean, if Gary Johnson got up and actually, you know, gave a good speech about privatizing Social Security or doing something exciting and interesting, I would, but, I, but I'm not, you know, it's not worth endorsing if you're not, if you're not really passionate about a candidate and I'm not. Okay. What's that? Rand Paul? What is that? The Johnson was asked on the TV what What's is that? Johnson was asked on TV about Aleppo. And oh yeah, so yeah, I, I don't know that can focus somebody story. doesn't know where Aleppo is and has no clue what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah, and the last question, uh, who do you think was the best U.S. president in history? Was oh, it very, or I don't know. I'm not a historian. I mean, I would probably have to say George Washington because he quit. <laughs> He, he could have stayed president forever. And he did two terms, and he said, I'm gone, right? And he also didn't do a lot of damage. I mean, I think presidents almost never do good. I, mean, I think the first few presidents were probably pretty good. Had some real problems, but they're generally good. And then I think Cleveland in the, in the 19th century, and then Coolidge is the last good president that America had. That was a long, long time ago. Um, so, but, but I can't, let me, let me say this, because that tells me something about this election. They've never, ever in the history of America been two candidates worse than Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Never. This is the most disgusting, worst election in American history. I wish they both dropped dead. Thank because you the vice much. presidents would be much better than the, the president. Uh, my question is, have you seen the Big Short film, sir? The what? Big Short film, the movie. Oh, have I seen the Big Short movie? I haven't. I have not. Please tell me, what do you think about the punishment? The, uh, yeah. like, who's, who's supposed to be punished? Who was punished in this film? I think I didn't see the film, so I don't about know. The dissidents. <laughs> Look, if you're asking about the financial crisis, the financial crisis was caused by socialism. It was caused by an attempt of government to manipulate the housing market. It was caused by a socialistic attempt to get us into homes by manipulating markets and manipulating us as individuals. It was caused by massive regulation of the banks and distorting their incentives. It was caused by a complete distortion of the financial markets in the United States. It was caused by the socialist institution of a central bank which uh, kept interest rates below the rate of inflation artificially for two and a half years and therefore created a bubble. This was a crisis of government, of socialistic policies from beginning to end. Capitalism had nothing to do with it. The three industries that were affected by the financial markets, housing, mortgages, finance, are the three most regulated, most controlled, most socialistic markets in the United States. They were the ones that took the hit because they were the ones under the government thumb. Central planning, in central banking, in housing, in banks, it doesn't matter. Central planning doesn't work. Government trying to manipulate the economy always leads to crisis. The financial crisis is a wonderful example of bad government, of bad economic policies. It has zero to say about Wall Street, it has zero to say about so-called greed. There's greed, uh, a friend of mine, John Allison, always says, there's greed on Wall Street every day. It's right? The job is to make money, but if you create perverse incentives, if you create too big to fail, if you tell them you can get all their profits but we protect you on the downside, you create bad behavior. But that's all a creation of government. All right, no socialists. Thank you, sir. Applause, please.
Thank you for listening to that. Uh, możesz po polsku. Zanim pójdziemy na przerwę kawową, bo taka będzie i wysłuchamy tej fascynującej debaty, już goście się powoli zjawiają. Jeśli macie jakieś uwagi co do organizacji tego, co się wam nie podoba, podoba, biorę to na klatę. Zapraszam na after party też, też chętnie wypiję piwko. E, ale tutaj widzicie, czasem na, na slajdach się przewija link. Możecie wejść na ankietę na stronie i do wygrania jest pięć książek ufundowanych przez SPOR. Będą losowane wśród tych, którzy podadzą swój adres e-mail i powiedzą, co myślą o wydarzeniu. Oraz do wygrania jest zwrot kosztów podróży na European Students for Liberty Conference w Katowicach oraz, oraz opłaty rejestracyjnej, ponieważ ISFL jest sponsorem naszej przerwy kawowej i zapraszam do zapoznania się z projektem tej organizacji tam przy stoliku. A teraz przerwa, widzimy się 10 po 8.